Hello, my name is Bob Garrett, President and CEO of the Greater Susquehanna Valley Chamber of Commerce. In one month and one day, it will be Election Day 2020, an election that has already been coined as the most important in a generation, or was it in the history of our country? We welcome you to this candidate's forum hosted by the Greater Susquehanna Valley Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the Lewisburg League of Women Voters. We also welcome our moderator, the Honorable Joseph McGranahan, the mayor of the borough of Shemokin Dam. Joe is a respected member of the media and advisor to our Commonwealth on matters as diverse as emergency services to traffic safety. Joe is a trusted friend. He chairs our, the Chamber's Transportation Committee and has received every leadership award or recognition given by our Chamber. So now as Joe moves into the moderator position, let's pause for a moment to hear from the League of Women Voters of the Lewisburg area about the importance of voting in our upcoming election. Hi, I'm Candy Duncan, president of the League of Women Voters for the Lewisburg area. I've been asked to say a few words today about what the League has been up to in preparation for the upcoming election. All year, the League of Women Voters has been celebrating the 100th anniversary of not only the ratification of the 19th Amendment, but also the formation of the League itself. It is actually amazing how many similar circumstances the suffragists and we, 100 years later, have, are facing. They had their own global pandemic in the form of, of the 1918 Spanish flu. Even the founder of the League, Carrie Chapman Catt, was bedridden from the flu during those early struggles. Additionally, their economy was struggling and they were dealing with a volatile racial environment. With all that, they prevailed and they got the vote. With the newly acquired vote, women had a need to be informed about candidates and issues that they'd never had to have a say in before enter the League of Women Voters. The League started educating and informing the enlarged electorate so the new voters could be informed voters. That mission carries on today as the main objective of the modern League. Now COVID has changed the world for all of us. Voting is one of the things that has changed. It used to be easy to vote. The biggest decision you had to make was who or what you would vote for. You went to your respective polling place and you voted. This year, you must decide how you're going to vote. You can still vote in person, but you must be sure to do it safely. Follow the now familiar mantra of wear your mask, social distance, no hanging out in large crowds, and try to go to the polling place during low volume times if you are able. The other option available is the mail-in ballot. Okay, a little more of history. The mail-in ballot is nothing new. Voting by mail can trace its roots to soldiers long before the Civil War. Pennsylvania was the first state to offer absentee voting for the soldiers in the War of 1812. Pennsylvania is again positioned to be a major factor in the outcome of this election because of being a swing state. It is imperative that we get this right. If you decide to take advantage of the mail-in voting, please follow the directions. Apply for your ballot now. Be sure to place your ballot in the secrecy envelope that is provided. Place the secrecy envelope in the mailing envelope, seal it, sign it, date it, and mail it. Or you can drop it off at the front desk of the local election board. If you do not use the secrecy envelope, your vote will be discarded. And we, won't, we don't want to lose any votes. This is pretty basic information, but if you have any questions, we have various sites that you can help. You can always go to the league's website, lwvlewisburgarea.org. 
for election information, vote411.org or votespa.com. Most importantly, vote and please do it safely. Good afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to go over the ground rules for today's Meet the Candidates Forum. First of all, we want to thank Senator Gordner and Ms. Siegel for their participation and willingness to help you make an informed decision on Election Day. Since this is not a debate, things will be handled a bit differently. Each candidate will be given two minutes to respond to every question we ask, and that time will be monitored. When they have 30 seconds remaining, our timekeeper will display to them an appropriate sign. When their time has expired, the timekeeper will display another sign that says, please stop, time up. So that we are fair to both candidates, the time limits will be strictly enforced. And to assure clarity, I will repeat the question before the second responder's time begins. We ask the candidates not to address each other, and we ask that they confine their answers to what and how they feel or what they would do and not attempt to characterize their opponent's positions. At the end, each candidate will be given time to answer why they feel they are the best choice for the 27th District of Pennsylvania in the State Senate. During that response, they are free to point out differences between themselves and their opponent. Our goal, as always at these chamber forums, is to generate light, not heat, so for that reason, the candidates have been given these questions in advance. With that, a coin toss has determined the order in which the candidates will respond, and we will reverse that order at the final question. Ms. Siegel won the toss and has elected to go first at the beginning and last at the end. Our first question. To open this, let's get to know each of the candidates. We're going to give each of them two minutes for the purposes of introducing themselves to you by way of their background, experience, important achievements, and family information. We'll start with Ms. Siegel. Uh, thank you, Mayor Joe. I also want to thank the Senator and Bob Garrett and everybody at the Chamber for having me. I also want to take a minute and acknowledge all of our essential workers that have been working hard in this pandemic and it's National Custodial Day, so I want to say a thank you to them. I'm a Snyder County girl. I, I grew up right here in Seals Grove. I was born and raised here. I went to Seals Grove High School, graduated the top of my class valedictorian. I went to Susquehanna University and have a degree in Earth and Environmental Science. And I graduated summa cum laude. My family has ties to this area. My gr great grandfather uh, was the head of, of the Snyder County Trust right in Seals Grove. My uh, grandfather, who was a very successful small business owner, ran a number of companies. Uh, I grew up when he was running a water company, and I know what it's like to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning because it's a family business, and there's a water main break, and that's what your job is to help your family. So I've, I've lived this stuff here. I, I, I understand what's going on. I have worked as a youth leader. I have uh, volunteered at the Regional Engagement Center where I work with children in a summer camp where we work on musicals and, and help kids have a chance to, to express themselves in a positive way and, and build up some faith in themselves that we need right now. I, I believe in rural people. I believe in community. I came from a family with one side of the family was small business owners. The other side of the family was uh, workers. So I've seen both sides. And I, I think it's time that we come together. I think it's time we stop dividing each other. And I, I think it's time that uh, rural people had their voices heard. And, and, that's, and that's why I'm doing this. Okay, thank you. Senator Gordner, your two minutes to introduce yourself by way of your background, experience, important achievements, and family information. Thank you very much, Joe, and I want to thank the Chamber for hosting this event. I've been honored to be the State Senator since 2003 representing this district. Uh, state Senators basically have two responsibilities. One is handling constituent matters and dealing with projects back in the district, and the second is to be a legislator in Harrisburg. I've been pleased that I've continued to have three district offices representing the district, one right here in Shemokin Dam, one in Mount Carmel, and one in Bloomsburg. 
uh, to service the 260,000 people of the district. I'm pleased that uh, just this year we've handled thousands of constituent requests, uh, helping folks with unemployment comp, uh, helping businesses with matters as well, uh, dealing with PennDOT related issues, uh, with PennDOT being closed. Uh, I've been pleased to uh, be available to the constituents. Uh, just over the last two years, I've done five or six teletown halls uh, in which the average uh, viewership has been about 4,000 people on those teletown halls where we've taken live questions from constituents and, and done polls as well. In Harrisburg, uh, I've been one of the most successful legislators in regard to getting bills done and to the governor. Just since I've been state senator, I've had over 45 bills uh, signed into law, almost all of them, I should mention, with unanimous votes uh, because of the bipartisan way in which I'm able to do things in Harrisburg. Um, I've been involved in hundreds of projects. I actually have uh, about 120 projects listed right here, uh, whether uh, they've been uh, more recently in McClure, Kramer, Point Township, Lewis Township, Shimokin, uh, Montour Preserve, Danville. Uh, getting monies for valuable projects uh, for uh, constituents, et cetera. Finally, as Majority Whip, uh, I'm there at every meeting in regard to the budget, in regard to any important issue. I'm one of the top three or four elected officials in the Senate, and that means that we're always represented in Harrisburg. Thank you. The pandemic has had a dramatic effect on Pennsylvania's economy. Many of the measures implemented by Governor Wolf have been controversial. What impact have his decisions had on the 27th district and what, if anything, would you have had him do differently? And this, we start with Senator Gordon. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the first mistakes that was made by the governor and the Secretary of Health has to do with nursing homes. If you go back to the state of Washington, the biggest flare up and the biggest issue out there was in a nursing home in Washington state. Uh, our governor and Secretary of Health, and by the way, uh, the nursing homes are under the purview of the Secretary of Health, uh, were not ready. They did not have the PPEs there and were not ready with uh, provisions and regulations. And we continue to see the problem and the failure with nursing homes right in our area, uh, whether it's in Milton or in Shimokin or in, uh, now in Montour County. So that is something that uh, they failed at and they should have been better prepared uh, to deal with our most vulnerable people in, in those nursing homes. Other is in regard to inconsistencies that the governor has done in applying rules. Uh, the business waiver program that he did back in uh, March and April, I would say is a failure. It's currently under review by the Auditor General, and it's gonna be interesting to see how that turns out. But how one business in one county and another business in another county were treated differently uh, and uh, shouldn't have been done. It's interesting, we talk about following uh, medical advice and following the science, and yet, Governor Wolf and Secretary Levine have ignored the recommendations of the largest hospital system in the state. The largest hospital in the state has made recommendations, and both Governor Wolf and Secretary Levine have said that they are wrong and incorrect. Um, I also uh, bring a great criticism uh, to some of the things that he did where we were the only state in the country. For a while, we were the only state in the country that didn't allow construction. We were the only state in the country that didn't allow the real estate industry uh, to work while people were out looking for homes and apartments, and the only state in the country to not allow auto sales. That was wrong. Ms. Siegel, the pandemic has had a dramatic effect on Pennsylvania's economy. Many of the measures implemented by Governor Wolf have been controversial. What impact have his decisions had on the 27th District, and what, if anything, would you have had him do differently? So I, I wanna back up a second here and point out that some of us have been trying to raise children and take care of our families in a pandemic. I am a mother of an adopted child. That mother gave me and my husband a chance to be a parent. And she grabbed me and said, always look out for my kid. We are talking about life here. This, 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 this conversation, when the legislature doesn't pass the PPE, the hazard pay, the, the HVAC system stuff that we needed done that the CDC required, and may I ask that the chamber actually said should be in place, 
isn't it the governor's responsibility and, and constitutionally protected right to protect the people? This is the people's. Harrisburg belongs to the people. That is what needs to be said here. This is the, if the government is not protecting the people and doing it all it can to get us through this, then, then what are our tax dollars doing? W what is the point of this? Because that, that is a failure of the system. It, it, it's, it's not working. Our, our job in this pandemic is to get people through it. And right now we're playing catch up and, and impeach the governor, impeach the, go what is that gonna do? It's not gonna save a struggling business, it's deflection. It is deflection. It's not going to do anything to help anybody. Uh, and I, it, it's just going to go to the lieutenant governor. Are you going to impeach him? What did he do? What did he do? He, they instated the same polities that they did in Ohio, in Florida, in Texas. Are you advocating, are we advocating that those Republican governors should also be impeached? What are we doing right now? Let's take care of our kids. Let's take care of the businesses that are struggling and figure out ways America used to have a great passion and excitement for going forward. Ms. Eagle, this question goes to you first. The governor has been criticized for being tone deaf when it comes to Pennsylvania's businesses struggling under his pandemic restrictions. Has the governor gone too far in his efforts to protect us from this virus or not far enough? So, Listen, do I think there could have been more transparency in the waiver process? Absolutely. Do I think there could have been more communication to the counties? Absolutely. But how can you get that communication to the counties when the majority of the counties did not have a, um, a medical outreach person that was relaying that information from the Department of Health to the county? The majority of counties in the state did not have that. Do we know why? Because we've been defunding the Department of, this Department of Health for, for generations. $127 million has been taken from the Department of Health in the last 12 years. We are not equipped. We are defunding the things that need funded and not funding the things that the people need. We are in a pandemic. We are having conversations here right now that should be had after. We can all come and sit down at the table and say, look, next time we know this is what we do and this is what we not do. But we're in the middle of this, we're not out of it. And I, I, this playing this Monday night quarterback game, I, I, it's irresponsible, it's deflection because this legislature continues to not act on the behalf of the people that it represents. And that means the small business owners who have lots of liability issues that we still haven't worked out either. So aren't we risking them as well in this pandemic? That, that, that's, that's what I need to say here. This is, this is, we're not giving people the proper precautions, the proper safety things that they need in place to get through this successfully. And when you don't do that, then the governor has the constitutional right, and I believe it's been in there from the 60s. If this was a blizzard, if this was a uh, tornado, if this was a flood, would any of you be questioning this? No because sometimes things out of control happens and it's the government's job to get us through it. Senator Gordner, the governor has been criticized for being tone deaf when it comes to Pennsylvania's <coughs> businesses struggling under his pandemic restrictions. Has the governor gone too far in his efforts to protect us from the virus or not far enough? First of all, I wanna say, uh, look, we haven't gone through anything like this uh, in 100 years, uh, so there's gonna be some mistakes made and hopefully we learn as those mistakes are made so that uh, we, can, we can go forward in regard to how we do it. I have been proud to be part of some bipartisan efforts, uh, including in May when we passed a, uh, what about a close to $3 billion Federal CARES Act. And you know what we did, Joe? We sent money to uh, hospitals for PPE. We sent money to nursing homes for PPE. We adopted a program for hazard pay. And I'm glad that there were, uh, I don't know how many dozen employers in our area that applied for that and got money, in fact, uh, for hazard play. So I was glad to be part of that bipartisan effort to make sure that that was done in late May. But you know what? Governor Wolf is one of, I believe, five governors in the state that received an F from the Wall Street Journal in regard to his handling of the economy during this pandemic. One of five that got an F. And that doesn't come lightly, and the Wall Street Journal is not a slanted uh, publication. 
It's because of the way he has done things as compared to what the other governors have done. I mentioned a couple of, of examples. Only state in the country that wasn't allowing construction, real estate, or auto sales, when frankly people needed access to homes, people needed access to cars to get to work. So to do that was just irresponsible. Our unemployment rate continues to be several points higher than the national average, uh, which is not acceptable. Um, and why inconsistencies in regard to Home Depot, Walmart, Target, and Lowe's, and small businesses along the streets of Sealands Grove, or Mount Carmel, or Shimokin, or Danville, or Lewisburg? Why should there be hundreds of people allowed to be in a Walmart or Lowe's, and yet a small business in a downtown area with, a, with one or two employees can't have four or five people in a day to patronize their business? That's wrong. Senator Gordner, the state Senate has passed bipartisan legislation to loosen Governor Wolf's pandemic restrictions on bars and restaurants, and I believe the vote was 43 to 6. The bill would end the requirement that customers buy food in order to purchase alcohol and permit patrons to be served drinks at the bar. The governor has announced he'll veto this legislation if it reaches his desk. How do you feel about this particular piece of legislation and the governor's assertion that he will veto it? Well, obviously, I voted in, for that, uh, in favor of that legislation, and you're correct. It passed uh, 43 to 6 uh, by the Senate uh, with bipartisan, bri uh, broad bipartisan support. It passed in the House 145 to 56. Uh, it'll be going uh, to uh, the governor on Monday, and he has said that he will veto it. Our hospitality industry has been brutalized, just brutalized by the governor in regard to his restrictions. And what restaurants want is to be able to follow CDC guidelines and allow people in, and then let those folks make the decision. Uh, they are putting up barriers, plastic barriers. Uh, they are putting tables six feet apart. They are requiring masks when people come in. And so those hardworking restaurants and the VFWs, the wineries, the breweries, are saying, let us operate under CDC guidelines, but don't further tie our hands behind our back. And, and I don't get it. He has not produced any data to support those restrictions. Why, if you're at a bar having a beer and a hot dog, why does the hot dog help to protect you from the virus? I mean, why having a hot dog makes the difference and not just having a beer there? Why, if you're one single person, can't you sit at the bar and you have to take up a table? Those are the problems. And our restaurants and wineries and breweries and VFWs and social clubs and taverns are hurting as a result of it. And they are offended by what uh, he has done. Yet now with this self-certification, the, uh, the, uh, the Home Depots and the Lowe's don't have to self-certify. Why do the restaurants and the taverns and the VFWs and the social clubs have to self-certify? It is offensive. Ms. Siegel, the state senate has passed bipartisan legislation to loosen Governor Wolf's pandemic restrictions on bars and restaurants by a vote of 43 to 6. The bill would end the requirement that customers buy food in order to purchase alcohol and permit patrons to be served drinks at the bar. The governor has announced he will veto this if it reaches his desk. How do you feel about this legislation and the governor's assertion that he will veto it? I wouldn't vote for a death bill. It is a death bill. We know what happened in Florida when DeSantis removed those restrictions and those bars were open and then they had an outbreak. That's what happens. Th th this. <laughs> We're, 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 we're deflecting again, okay? Because th this, this bill isn't doing necessarily what it says. It just seems like it's just giving the uh, alcohol board power to decide who stays open. We're in a health emergency. The Department of Health handles health, okay? We, we, we shouldn't be conflating the two in this bill. The, the, the other issue I, I need to put out, that this bill is a death bill for people and it's a death bill for businesses. Nobody has been addressing the issue of insurance here enough for a small business owner. You open these places up and there is an outbreak. A number of insurance companies had said, we will not cover you if you were not following the CDC policies. This would be against CDC policy. These small business owners would be liable. They could go bankrupt. You're a corporation. Yeah, you probably make it through this, you get sued. A small business owner is not going to make it through. Th this is we have to be serious here about what actually is helping small business and what isn't. This isn't helping. This isn't helping the situation. 
Where, what I would like to see done, you know why, how the bars could have been open sooner? If our legislator had gotten the HVAC systems upgraded and helped these small business owners, we could have done a major project, we could have grown businesses, we could have got good blue collar jobs installing these HVAC systems into these businesses and they would have been more successful. We would have been farther along in reopening, way farther along, and we wouldn't be having this discussion. Bars probably could be farther open along if they had proper uh, HVAC ventilation upgrades, but that didn't happen. So now the governor, once again, has to go back and protect the people because the legislature did not do it. Th this, this conversation has got to stop. This, the pandemic is, is the issue. It's not the governor, the, it's the pandemic. Okay. Ms. Siegel, if you are elected in the upcoming term, what committees would you like to serve on and how do you see your membership on those committees benefiting the 27th Senatorial District? So this, this is an interesting question for me because I, I'm looking at a lot of, of, of these, these committees and I, I first I would wanna do is help the ones that help rural. Obviously I would wanna be on, uh, the uh, agriculture and rural affairs, we have got to do better for rural outreach. We need somebody on a committee that's actually going to sit there and advocate for what is going on with rural people. They are worried about their mortgages. They are worried about how they're gonna pay their bills. They are worried about their health care. They're worried about their hospital in Sunbury closing that nothing has been done with. We are down 63 beds and 150 jobs in a pandemic. Rural is being taken care away from constantly. We are being extracted from, it's, it's wrong. Aging and youth, I'd love to be on. During, when the shutdown happened, do you know what, what happened actually in the community? People stepped up and helped their, got food to their elders because it wasn't happening, because we didn't have a system in place to make sure people were taken care of. This is unacceptable. This has got to change. I would be on environmental resources and energy. I have an environmental science background. I think I could be a great advocate that's pro-worker and pro-environment at the same time to help grow business. Health and human services. My mother is a frontline worker at Evan. She is working in a pandemic and risking her life every day, every day. And I have to live through the calls when my mother tells me there might have been a case, I can't see you anymore. Do we understand what's happening to real people? Do, do we understand that we need help here? Labor and industry, I'm a big advocate for labor. Uh, veterans Affairs and Emergency is, is the other one that I'd like to be on because our veterans get worse health care than our elected officials. It's not okay. They put their life on their line. I am the proud granddaughter of two World War II veterans and I'm watching these people struggle. It's time to change this. Okay, Senator Gordner, if you are elected in the upcoming term, what committees would you like to serve on and how do you see your membership on them benefiting the 27th Senatorial District? I realize this question's a little different for you since you're in a whipped position. Thank you. Uh, yes, for the past six years, I've been proud to serve as Majority Whip uh, for the Senate. Again, uh, that's one of the top leadership positions. It allows me to be at the table for all of the uh, large discussions, uh, whether it's on the issue or whether on uh, legislative issues or whether it's uh, budget related. Uh, I serve as vice chair of the Rules Committee. Uh, Rules Committee is one of the most powerful committees uh, there. The majority leader serves as chair. I serve as vice chair. Uh, it's where a lot of the executive nominations come through and I've been glad to get local people on a number of uh, state agencies and state boards as a result of it. Uh, I've been on the Transportation Committee, uh, which isn't going to be a surprise. I made sure I put myself on that uh, as we were talking about beginning the CSVT project, and I will remain on that committee until the CSVT project is done. I'm pleased that Representative Culver got herself on the House Transportation Committee to make sure that uh, she was covering the House side as well. But it has helped to make sure that we have uh, got hundreds of projects done in the, in the area. I've been on the Judiciary Committee. I'm actually one of the few lawyers left in the Senate. There aren't a lot of us anymore. Uh, but the Judiciary Committee is one of the most active committees in the Senate. And we've done uh, a number of things. And for instance, uh, with domestic violence, uh, we've passed some strong legislation there. And just this year, as a result of the outbreak in regard to race issues, uh, we passed uh, four different bipartisan, unanimous bills through the Judiciary and the Senate. Uh, to make sure that we dealt more with uh, racial prejudice and those sort of hate crime issues. And finally, I've been on the Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure Committee. 
uh, for the entire 17 years I've been in the Senate. So making sure that consumer protection issues are identified, whether they're PUC related or elsewhere, and also with professional licensure. Uh, I'm able to help uh, the nurses uh, get their uh, licenses when they graduate and get ready to work in Geisinger or Evangelical and to uh, deal with those uh, health care related issues. Senator Gordon, Pennsylvania's Supreme Court has just ruled that mail-in ballots in the general election can be counted for up to three days after election day. Many people are concerned about the potential for, for fraud while others believe those fears are baseless. Do you have any concerns about how the vote will be handled in Pennsylvania, and what, if anything, do you need, uh, think needs to be done to assure a fair, accurate, and prompt count? First of all, I have uh, total confidence in our local counties and our local uh, voter registration offices. Uh, I've been in touch with the county commissioners uh, in Snyder and Montour and Northumberland as just an example. Uh, I know in the primary or prior to the primary uh, date there were some issues in Northumberland County. Uh, that has been taken care of and uh, Representative Culver and I which were involved in that uh, appreciate uh, that. So I feel very confident in our local uh, county boards and our local voter registration offices. Very frustrated how political the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has become. Uh, there are five Democrats, two Republicans on it. Um, two weeks ago and for a month, uh, the House and the Senate and the Governor's Office uh, was in negotiations for an omnibus election code bill. Uh, my office was directly involved in those negotiations and we were close. We were close to about two weeks or so ago when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court made their decision and when they made their decision on a number of big issues and legislated from the bench, and that's the biggest problem, they legislated from the bench items that are not in our state election code uh, the governor's office basically backed off from the discussions, which is a shame, because there's issues like with canvassing that we were close to negotiating a, uh, a compromise on uh, that now has stepped back. But again, if you know some of the things that the Supreme Court did in that decision, they're saying that the votes can be received up to three days after election, whether there's a postmark on it or not, or not. Uh, a number of these entities that are sending uh, these ballot uh, applications to folks uh, are pre-postmarked. Uh, so t for them to say that's amazing. They're saying that you can put drop boxes anywhere. They don't have to be secured. They have not, no restriction on the location. That's not right. And saying that poll workers can't go into Philadelphia from our area because they're going to intimidate people in Philadelphia to watch what's going on there is not acceptable. Ms. Siegel, Pennsylvania Supreme Court has just ruled that mail-in ballots in the general election can be counted for up to three days after election day. Many people are concerned about the potential for fraud while others believe those fears are baseless. Do you have any concerns about how the vote will be handled in Pennsylvania and what, if anything, do you think needs to be done to assure a fair, accurate, and prompt count? I do have concerns about leading questions, but anyways, um this, this is, <laughs> so the legislature passed the bill, Act 77 and Act 12, that allows mail-in voting. T to defer this and deflect this back on the governor, again, I don't understand it, you pass it. Now, I guess in Pennsylvania, most much voters don't know is we actually call them no excuse absentee ballots because we cleverly worded that in the legislation so that we could point out the hypocrisy of mail-ins with walking our hands up in the air and saying, oh, it's not mail-ins. So why is it the voters' fault if the mail does not get that mail-in ballot there on time? It is, if that voter is postmarking that ballot on election day, that voter's vote should not be disenfranchised. This is about upholding what our founders wanted us to do, the right to vote. That is our job as taxpaying citizens of this country. And if we do anything to jeopardize that, to take that away, we are killing democracy. And that's what's happening this election. And we should all be ashamed of ourselves that we're even having this conversation. Working people deserve a chance to vote. My father got up every day at 5.30 morning, ran home on election day, showered quick to go stand in the poll lines for three hours. If he had mail-in voting, he wouldn't have, have done that. He could have submitted his mail-in ballot successfully and legally. 
our veterans and those overseas have been voting this way since the Civil War. There is no fraud. Republicans win with mail-in ballots as well. I, 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 am, I, I cannot believe in a pandemic we are poo-pooing the, the safe way to vote and, t and disenfranchising people. It, it's not okay. We have the power, the voter has the power, and it's our right to use it. Ms. Siegel, the Central Susquehanna Valley Thruway Project is one example of a transportation or infrastructure project with a profound economic impact on the area it will serve. Without funding, it could have never happened. How important is funding PennDOT to you, and what steps should be taken to assure its long-term financial viability? So I just want to take a second and thank all of the PennDOT workers who have been building the, the, the bypass. Um, it's going to be a lifesaver for my husband that commutes to, to Williamsport uh, an hour each way. It, we need these projects. The issue is when you're defunding uh, departments, they can't function, and then you have to put a tax on working people, like the gas tax, to try to filter that monkey back in because we've been putting it in places where it shouldn't be. The gas tax is hurting working people. It hurts rural people the most. You, we have uncapped a 12 cent flat cap, and now we are paying 80 cents on the dollar. So every 10 gallons of gas, you are paying $8 in tax, rural people. We drive everywhere. Our hospitals are closing. We gotta drive to the next place. What the problem is here is we could have funded this with the way the Pennsylvania Constitution says, with a severance tax. It says anything that's mined from the ground in liquid state can be used to fund infrastructure. That money could have been put in a severance tax. We wouldn't be so burdened with a gas tax. There are other ways to fund things. And that's what we need to do here. We need to look outside the box, take working people's into account here better, and put up legislation that adequately funds these things so they're not so they're successful, so that our workers can do exactly what they need to do. And PennDOT's had to cut programs and programs again just recently. They've had to lay off workers. This system is not working, okay? Get a severance tax, use that money to fund these programs, stop taking money from one place and sticking it somewhere else. Government needs to be more honest. Government needs to be for the people and not overburden tax hardworking people that can barely pay some days to put $2 in their car. So, I don't agree, I agree with we needed to do it, but it's just not the way it should be done. Senator Gordon, the Susquehanna Valley Thruway Project is one example of a transportation or infrastructure project with a profound economic impact on the area it will serve. Without funding, it would have never happened. How important is funding PennDOT to you and what steps should be taken to assure its long-term financial viability? Uh, very important. Uh, I voted for the uh, bipartisan transportation funding bill back in 2013. I remember being at a rally with former Governor Ed Rendell and then Governor Tom Corbett standing together uh, with members, all of the uh, House and Senate Democrat and Republican chairs supported that transportation funding because it was so important. Uh, back then, Pennsylvania led the nation in the number of structurally deficient bridges. Led the nation in it. That wasn't good. I am pleased that over the past five years, as a result of that funding, we have fixed 1,200 of those structurally deficient bridges, and Pennsylvania has led the nation over the last five years in fixing the most number of structurally deficient bridges so that those folks that are driving to and from work are making sure that they go over safe bridges. I am more than honored, more than pleased, that as a result of that project, our area got the largest transportation funding project in the state, in the state. Think of that. Little old central Susquehanna Valley got the largest transportation funding project in the state, over $850 million. Also, at the same time, though, I'm pleased that we have in our area hundreds of other road and bridge projects throughout the district, big and small, in Snyder County, Northumberland County, Montour County, Union County, Columbia County. Um, and I am pleased that in our state we have a lockbox. The gas tax, the car registration, the driver's licenses all go to a separate motor vehicle fund, and that's where they are. 
And those projects have to be used, and those monies have to be used for transportation related projects and mass transit. And as you know, we've been working on that with CDCOG, and I've uh, arranged meetings uh, in order to make sure that we get some public transportation here in my area. Senator Gordner, there has been considerable talk about the Green New Deal and the impact it would have on Pennsylvania as an energy producing state. How has Pennsylvania either benefited from or been harmed by fracking, and what steps, if any, should we be taking to improve our environment? Look, Pennsylvania is blessed with the abundance of natural gas. It's hard to believe that eight years ago we actually had to import uh, natural gas into our area, and now we are uh, an exporter. Matter of fact, only second to Texas in the country in the regard of natural gas that we have had. It has produced, and listen to this, hundreds of thousands of jobs. Hundreds of thousands of jobs as a result of uh, the natural gas. By the way, we have a local impact fee. We're the only state in the country that has a local impact fee on those uh, natural gas sites. And that has produced, again, listen to the numbers, several billion dollars of uh, monies and projects. Every single county uh, gets money, whether it's for bridge projects or recreation projects, as a result of that local impact fee. And we're the only state in the country that has it. Um, workers are nervous. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was with laborers, unions, boilermakers, building trades, and they're nervous about what might happen come November in regard to the jobs that are out there. Because these are jobs that pay between sixty and $80,000 a year. Right now in Beaver County, we have the largest construction project in the country, a $6 billion project that's being built out there, thousands of construction jobs. And as a result of legislation we passed, not one Pennsylvania taxpayer dollar has gone into that site. Nothing will come into uh, uh, us in regard to it until that $6 billion project is up and running. I do believe that we need to protect the environment, uh, and I've been proud to support uh, Growing Greener number one uh, under, I believe, Tom Ridge, and Growing Greener number two under uh, Ed Rendell, which has uh, resulted, I think, in over in a billion dollars that has gone to state parks to go to a local recreation that has helped to keep open places like Montour Preserve, and we need to continue to do that. Ms. Siegel, there's been considerable talk about the Green New Deal and the impact it would have on Pennsylvania as an energy producing state. How has Pennsylvania either benefited from or been harmed by fracking, and what steps, if any, should we be taking to improve our environment? So, I understand that fracking brought jobs here. My husband works in Williamsport, but those were temporary jobs by people from Oklahoma and Texas. They were not lasting labor jobs. They were not blue collar jobs. And I might point out here, Shimokin. the people of Shimokin have been promised the coal was coming back for a long time. It's not there. That community is falling apart. Where is the severance tax so we can revitalize these communities that have been built on promises that are not kept? Rural is dying. I understand, I, I, I'm an environmental science major. You don't, I know what happens with fracking. I know the process. I know how fragile our groundwater is. And I know that our children are getting nose gushing, bleeding out of their nose at night at two o'clock in the morning that are living by those wells. So what do, what do we have going on here? We have an issue, again, where an industry is skirting environmental policy to do whatever they want in Pennsylvania, and our lives are on the line. We are, chronic health in rural is out of control. Rural cancer, out of control. We have the third worst air quality, the third worst water quality in the United States. Pennsylvania is lagging. This, where, where's, where's the investment we were promised? Where's all this revenue? I, I'm not seeing it. I don't think the constituents are seeing it. I think many of us are tired of hearing these, these spins of the truth. Fracking is finite. It's not going to last forever. We need diversification so our workers are protected so that they can get a job that lasts the future. Green jobs actually are the highest in Pennsylvania right now, not the fracking jobs. We must invest, diversify, and make sure people are protected so our communities 
are consistent and they're not being depleted because that's what's happening in rural. We've reached final remarks and to conclude, we will give each candidate three minutes to make the case why he or she should be elected to serve as Senator for the 27th Senatorial District. Now we will reverse the order and start this time with Senator Gordner. Senator. Thank you, and once again, Joe and the Chamber, thank you for hosting this forum. Uh, I've been honored since uh, 2003 to serve as the State Senator from the 27th Senatorial District, uh, representing the 260,000 hardworking people. Uh, I'm very proud of the, my parents, uh, two hardworking individuals, my dad over 40 years of Wise Potato Chips, uh, my mom over 40 years as a registered nurse. Uh, they brought me up as a hardworking individual. I've worked since I was 12. Uh, through high school, through college, law school, and, and ever since. They also told me to be honest, and uh, probably the most important thing to me, mo both here in my district and back in Harrisburg, is integrity. Uh, people recognize that, and that's not going to change. But I'm going to have to call out uh, some of the lies uh, that my opponent has said over the last couple of weeks. And I think it's unfortunate that she's doing it just to get a couple of votes. She said corporations buy off career uh, politicians like myself to get giveaways like the Delaware loophole. First of all, to say that I've been bought off is a criminal allegation, Michelle. It is criminal. Quid pro quo is illegal in the state of Pennsylvania. So to say that is outrageous, and I demand an apology. Second, to say that uh, corporations buy off career politicians uh, must show that you're naive and again is outrageous. Guess what? Corporations cannot give contributions to politicians in Pennsylvania. In every uh, fundraiser that I have at the very bottom of it, it says corporate checks are not allowed by Pennsylvania law. So to say that is outrageous and wrong. And if you don't have it on your fundraiser, you need to go back and talk to your campaign manager to do it because corporations are not allowed in Pennsylvania to give corporate comp contributions. I demand an apology on that as well. And to give giveaways like the Delaware loophole, guess what? I've been in the legislature for 28 years. We've never passed a Delaware loophole. There's never been any legislation to create a Delaware loophole. So that's false. So to put that out in text messages and in uh, articles uh, in the newspaper is just wrong. The most recent thing, and you referred to, to uh, here today, something you posted on your Facebook page, is that I voted to cut Department of Health funding, diabetes, rural cancer outreach, sickle cell, rural trauma, Tourette's, oncology. You know what's funny about that? Is Governor Wolf, in every budget that he has introduced in Harrisburg, has cut funding. He has cut funding, I'm sorry, eliminated funding for diabetes, regi regional cancer, sickle cell, trauma, Tourette, leukemia, adult cystic fibrosis, Cooley's anemia, hemophilia, lupus, poison control, epilepsy, and ALS. And guess who's voted to put that money back in? I have. I have. I can show you the thank you letters from all of those organizations in which I have restored the money that the governor uh, eliminated. Let's have honesty. Let's have integrity. Let's be hardworking. I would appreciate your vote again in November. Ms. Siegel, three minutes to uh, explain why you believe you should be the person elected to serve as senator for the 27th Senatorial District. So it, um, corporate lobbyist donations are not illegal. Uh, campaign finance in Pennsylvania is an dismal embarrassment. My grandfather owned a water company right here. Do you know who came in and bought that water company? Aqua. Do you know who Aqua works for? It's very tied with the fracking industry. They also give you a lot of money. And they kind of screwed my grandfather over. So we're not working for small businesses here, Mr. Gordner. The other thing is, the Delaware loophole, it, it, it's a problem. It, it creates it, it, an issue where our small businesses cannot compete on a level playing field that these corporations are doing in Pennsylvania. And that's, that's the truth. And I, 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 this, this, there's stats and facts on this. Keystone Budget and Policy Center has done it. These are not fabrications. And the 127 million is true. Maybe you need to go back and check your votes. Maybe you don't know what you're voting for anymore. Maybe you don't read the bills. I've been reading the bills. 
and there's so much shady stuff going on in Harrisburg, it is out of control. There are small little things. I don't know what you guys are up to, but I care about the people here. I'm not doing this for myself. If I was doing this for myself, I'd be out parading around and doing photo ops like you are. I am volunteering in my community. I've been doing that since I've been day one because I care about these people and it's time for change. This is unacceptable. We are staring down a disaster scenario in this state. It is in such financial distress and our senator has been here for 17 years. Can you all name a bill that, that has helped you? Because I can't. I can't. And I'm not going to sit here and take this anymore and get bashed. It's, I'm the bad Democrat who wants to tax. You've been taxing the people. You have. And not your donors. And you know this. And I am your conscience, sir. And I am standing up for all these people who have had it. Because we have. I'm not going to sit here. Do you know what my life has been? I have watched my dad work his butt off in this community as a laborer. And when his daughter got sick, his insurance would not pay for it. I had to go on Medicaid. That's what's happening to working people. That's what's happening in the real world. We are worried about our rent. We are worried about our health care. We are worried about our broadband. You think you fixed that? You passed a bill that just gives some people some grants. We need infrastructure development like FDR did. Put out these programs, get broadband out to the people, get them health care, stop closing their hospitals. You have did nothing when Sunbury closed. Nothing. Nothing. You stood there and gave a speech and a, you renewed an EMS grant that you renew every year. You did nothing. I went to that hospital. It saved my life. It saved my grandfather's life. It saved a friend of mine's life. 20 more minutes, he would be dead. Where are you? You're not here. You're not. You're not. I'd like to thank both of you. Um, despite getting a little heated at the end, you both have more than adhered to the ground rules of the debate. I think we have uh, achieved our goal to generate heat rather than, or rather light rather than heat. And I thank you both for taking the time to be here with us today. Michelle Siegel, the Democratic candidate for the 27th Senatorial District. Senator John Gordner, the incumbent senator representing that district. On behalf of Bob Garrett, our president of the chamber, and all the members of the chamber, thank you so very much for being with us today. Take care.